Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to today's lesson, which has to do completely and totally with the Korean War. Um, we're going to talk about it essentially from start to finish. So our essential question for today, which you can put as a left side question, is what led to the Korean War? Uh, and just so you know, um, the Korean War lasted from 1950 until 1953. So let's go ahead and have a conversation about that. Uh, the picture there, you are now crossing the 38th parallel. Uh, before the Korean War, the 38th parallel of latitude marked the border between what we now know as North Korea and South Korea. So again, you do not have to copy down every single note here, but I would like you to get the gist of this. Uh, after each slide, I will basically tell you the most important things. Um, up until that point, it's more important that you actually just listen um, and understand the dynamics here. So, uh, North Korea, which we call the DPRK, the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, had been heavily armed by the Soviet Union. So remember, after World War II, the Soviet Union, which we now call Russia, um, armed and supported the North Koreans. And so North Korea um, had a very strong military. On the other hand, uh, the United States actually withdrew all of its forces from South Korea and did not do a lot to arm the South Korean government. Um, so you can probably see where this is headed. Remember, DPRK means North Korea, ROK means South Korea. So on June 25th, 1950, North Korea, with the support of the Soviet Union, basically saw an opportunity and invaded the South um, with the support of the Soviet Union and the newly communist Chinese government. So China's just to the north of North Korea. So although uh, at this point, Soviet and Chinese troops were not involved, um, they offered lots of support to the North Koreans in the hope that they could unify the Korean Peninsula and create it as a communist country. So the United Nations, two days later, um, with the U.S. in the lead, authorized forces be sent to South Korea to repel the invasion of the North. So two days later, uh, the United Nations joined the fight, although over 90% of the troops from the United Nations were actually from the United States. So it was uh, essentially the United States fighting and the United Nations basically giving it the thumbs up, saying, yes, we support you doing this. We'll send you a few um, symbolic troops of our own, but really, if you want to do this, go for it. Uh, unfortunately for the South Koreans, before the U.S. reinforcements could arrive, um, the Republic of Korea forces, which were not very well equipped, were pushed back to a very, very small portion of South Korea on the very southern coast of the peninsula. Uh, and I'm going to show you some graphics of that on the next slide. Uh, you will get a sense of those dynamics when you see it. Um, they were almost defeated before reinforcements could arrive. Uh, in fact, that area was called a, the Pusan Perimeter. Uh, the North Koreans were extremely effective, and in a very short space of time, um, the South Koreans were back on their heels. So um, I'm going to go ahead and do my pause right now. But on the next slide, you're going to see what the Pusan perimeter looked like and just how close South Korea was to losing this war. In fact, they were almost pushed into the sea. Forgot that I had that bullet point there. All right, here we go. This is the Pusan perimeter, okay? So the 38th parallel is right about here. North Korean forces, which are represented by the red arrows, pushed the South Korean army back to this small little area here. This small little area here is the only part of Korea that was not ever taken over by the North Koreans. Um, the rest of the peninsula was taken over by the North Koreans. Uh, this graphic over here basically shows exactly the same thing. This small little area here 
is the only part of Korea that was never taken over by North Korea. Um, they basically just swept over the peninsula in about a month's time, uh, including the capital of Seoul. Seoul is the capital of South Korea. So um, that tells you just how desperate the situation was. And now we'll move on. So um, there was something called the Inchon Landing. Uh, the guy on the left there, that's Douglas MacArthur. Uh, he was a famous general for the United States during World War II. He was also involved in the Korean War. And what you're about to learn about was considered his most brilliant military tactic. It was called the Inchon Landing. Okay, The Pusan perimeter was down here. Notice the port of Inchon is way up here. So in September of 1950, U.S. and U.N. forces landed behind enemy lines at Inchon. This is what we call an amphibious landing. This was an attack from sea onto land, and they didn't do it down here at Pusan. They did it at Inchon, which is near Seoul, um, behind enemy lines. And it was an extremely effective invasion. In fact, it was so effective uh, after D General MacArthur planned the attack that uh, the troops were able to break out from the Pusan perimeter, and many North Korean forces ended up getting trapped and captured down here in the southern part of Korea because once the forces came in at Incheon, uh, they created a, a wall across Korea and trapped the North Koreans down here without the ability to get reinforcements, and so they were able to defeat a large part of the North Korean army, so much so that they were then able to push deep, deep, deep into the north, almost all the way to the Yalu River, uh, which is the border between China and Korea. And at this point, the United States and South Korean forces almost won the war in a short space of time. So we got, went from almost completely losing to almost completely winning within a couple months' time. Very intense and crazy reversals of fortune. So it started to become a route, and U.S. pushes forces, excuse me, pushed almost all the way to China. The only parts that were still left in North Korean hands were the parts you see in red right here. That's uh, not very much. And once again, I'm going to press pause. So, what happened when China joined the war? Yes, ladies and gentlemen, there was yet another wrinkle in this uh, story, and that wrinkle involved China recognizing the U.S. and U.N. forces were right on its doorstep, and we didn't have any communication with China at the time, so China just got involved, and things got real interesting. Just when the U.S. and U.N. forces, that should say forces, not forced, uh, believed they were going to defeat the DPRK in November 1950, China entered the war to help the North. Remember, the war only started in June. So all of this back and forth is going place, taking place between June and November. Very, very fast moving. Um, and China sent thousands and thousands of troops into North Korea to support the North Koreans. So now you actually have a major power that has stepped into the game. Because although the Russians backed North Korea, there were no actual Russian troops in North Korea um, for reasons you can ask me about if you want. Go ahead, ask me. So the Chinese forces actually pushed U.S. and U.N. forces back south of Seoul. Okay, this was the 38th parallel. This was the original border between North and South Korea. At this point, the Chinese and North Korean forces actually pushed um, the South Korean forces and the American forces down to this line right here which is south of the capital. So the capital changed hands once again. Seoul changed hands four times during this war. For almost three years at this point, both sides fought to a standstill and very little territory changed hands. In fact, both sides ended up, after the four years of this conflict, not very far from the original border of the 38th parallel. This right here 
is the line where they finally ended up facing off. So the South Korean forces in the US managed to retake Seoul and push back to about here. Um, this was the original border right here. So a little bit of South Korea got in North Korean hands there and a lar slightly larger chunk of North Korea got into South Korean hands here. Uh, but other than that, um, the entire war was fought and in the end, well, the only land that changed place was this little bit right here and this little bit right here. Um, a lot of people died and a lot of money got spent and a lot of bombs got dropped for not a lot of change. So how did this bad boy end? We're going to answer that on the next slide. How did the Korean War end? I, I had some fun with this slide. Uh, what you see here is a picture of the Armistice Village at Pan Moon Jam. And this is actually where the peace treaty was signed. They've built these buildings at Pan Moon Jam so that uh, each side can actually talk to the other side because they don't actually have direct communication except for this village. So this line you see on the ground here is the border. Okay? This is the Republic of Korea, South Korea. This is the DPRK, North Korea. And literally, they face off against each other like this. These are South Korean troops right here. These are North Korean troops right there. And they like stand right on the line. It's a very intense, bizarre, and interesting situation. See, these are North Korean soldiers right here. And that's South Korea in the background. So, an armistice was finally signed and it ended in the war in 1953. But as we're hearing in the news all the time, this was not a peace treaty. Both sides are still technically at war with each other, even though shots are not officially being fired. Okay? So there has never been a peace treaty to end the Korean War. So at the village of Panmunjom, which is in the picture here, um, both sides still face off across a line on the ground. And obviously that line is very visible to you in the picture. This is the literal border. And if you go inside those buildings, there are tables and there are wires and microphone wires on, on those tables across which the sides speak to each other, but they never cross to the other side of the line, ever. So the DPRK is in the foreground, meaning the front here, and the Republic of Korea is in the background. Actually, that should be reversed. That should be reversed. I'm going to actually go ahead and reverse these, but I'm not going to do it now. I'll do it after I'm done recording this video. So literally, since 1953, both sides have technically been at war. Um, both sides still have aspirations to take over the other side, although the North Koreans are obviously more aggressive about it. And um, so for the rest of this kind of discussion unit on uh, North Korea, I'm going to tell you how things have escalated to the point where they're at right now in the year 2017 uh, between President Trump and Kim Jong-un. But this is the historical background. It is now time to write those summaries at the bottom of your notes, ask Mr. B some questions, and uh, stay tuned until next time for what happened when the Korean War once again became a Cold War. And with that, this is Mr. Blumendahl, ladies and gentlemen. Once again, you know what's coming next. Signing off until next time on the Waldo Middle School Social Studies YouTube Network.